Thank you, Danny. Um, you ready for the lights? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is where I grew up. And it's interesting to me because shortly after the exhibition opened here, the element of water made itself very present here in Brattleboro and in Vermont. But in Maui, we had the opposite element. We had fire, um, which is just a side note. But anyway, you can see it, it was an incredible place to grow up, absolutely stunning and beautiful natural environment. And at the same time, I grew up as a minority in other people's land where, you know, Hilton hotels were being built on top of ancient burial grounds. So I experienced a lot of racism as a child growing up there and it was challenging. And I also had a very complicated family life um, my father was in and out of jail um, my whole life, <laughs> and uh, so that was a lot. Um, so I moved to New York City when I was a teenager, and I started making paintings. When I, had, uh, when I was a child back in, in Hawaii, when I was about third grade, I had these nightmares, these recurring nightmares, and I thought maybe I could paint them after I graduated from college only make them something that I wanted to look, with, look at and spend time with, kind of like a meditation uh, to subjugate the negative qualities of these nightmares. And the idea was to use color and composition, but maintain the formal structure of the nightmares. So this was a six by nine foot painting, oil painting, that uh, was one of my earlier explorations of this idea. But at this point, I'm living, you know, maybe kind of an opposite situation from Maui. This is New York City, a typical trash day. And um, I found it really astonishing. You know, I was actually born in Canada, which is also pristine natural environment. So this was a very high contrast uh, experience for me. And it struck me as bizarre that there was such an excess of this kind of material that you, you can try to get them to stop sending you. <laughs> but you know, as soon as I became pregnant with my first daughter, I suddenly started getting all these catalogs for baby supplies. And, and I didn't even have the baby in a hospital. It was a home birth, so I don't know how they found out. But um, anyway, so I started experimenting with this material the junk mail and integrating it into these nightmare landscapes. And it was wonderful and it's something I still love to do because it gives me an opportunity to play with text and I love wordplay um, and poetry and writing and li literature and all this sort of thing. And so it sort of gave me like ways to express myself slightly differently. Um, and also use realia, use material that other people encountered uh, in their daily lives. So this is a piece called Minimum Down. And uh, I was trying to buy a house at the time <laughs> that I made this. But, you know, the way I think about material is maybe different from how a lot of people think about it. Um, I look at this as art supplies. And this is what I would do with such things. Um, it, it always strikes me as crazy that there's so much energy and fossil fuel and money and time and, you know, people agreeing to make these packages that lie to us. You know, they make things look so delicious and then you open up your frozen TV dinner and it looks nothing like it. Um, so I just thought that was interesting and I thought maybe I could transform that type of thing into something that had some kind of truth. So this is a little triptych I made using that material called Scrutiny on the Bounty. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of like to play at any scale. I like, I like to think of my work as um, 
like an exercise in anti-discrimination. So it's inclusive to the point of insanity, maybe. <laughs> um, but, you know, at a certain point, I like to take things a little bit more seriously. And, you know, from living in New York, I noticed how much plastic in particular was everywhere. And it's something that is a much more problematic material. Scenes like this are happening increasingly around the world because the human population is going up. And as it does, biodiversity goes down. And it's actually less than 9% <laughs> is being recycled globally. We just don't have the infrastructure to recycle it at the velocity at which it's being created. And it has a way of making people feel really powerless and apathetical about it. Um, it's, it's a heavy, heavy thing, even though it's so lightweight and it blows all over the place. And there's a lot of misinformation around it. So the bottles started speaking to me um, because they were littered all over the streets of New York City. And I would see scenes like this outside of grocery stores everywhere. And as I became more interested in this material for sculpture, I learned about the chemical compositions and about how this material photodegrades. It doesn't biodegrade ever. Um, and by photodegradation, what happens is all the chemicals in the plastic leach into the liquids and foods inside of them. There was a, a big, a really big campaign, maybe 15 or so years ago, about BPA. And you started seeing, oh, this is bisphenol A free. This is safe plastic to use for your baby bottles and whatnot. Um, but it turned out they just replaced it with BPS that didn't have quite the um, reputation yet. <laughs> but it turned out to be just as problematic. And these are the chemicals that we, you know, allow ourselves to come into such intimate contact with on a daily basis and what they do to us. It's kind of depressing, to put it mildly. And most people don't really know what these chemicals are. You know, these, these symbols don't really mean they're getting recycled, obviously. It's just a chemical composition description, really. And um, even within polyethylene terephthalate, the number one, PET, there are infinite, it's infinite variety within that one type of plastic. So it's uh, like the Wild West for the plastics industries. Don't worry, I'll get past all the sad stuff soon, I promise. <laughs> So this, this, these kinds of facts and statistics that keep coming out um, fuel me to keep doing the work. And as I think it's pretty obvious, of course, it's entering the food chain uh, in the water is what most people associate with it. So I started playing around with the bottles because it turns out they have an attribute that you really can uh, experiment with, which is plasticity. It's kind of what you want in a sculpture medium, and it's also why the material is so problematic, because it'll do basically whatever you want it to. So these are the tools that I use. <laughs> this is just a pair of snips. It's a hand, They're like $15 or something, $20. You can buy them. Uh, this was my first exhibition at an art fair in New York City. And when, when I first started, um, I was actually so shy that I used some of the budget that was given to me to make this installation to pay my friend Erica to stand there and talk about the work for me. <laughs> and um, so people thought I was a little Asian girl for a while, <laughs> which was really funny. But um, this piece was called The Jungle. And it was the beginning of, you know, sort of just playing around with these bottles and seeing what could be done with them using uh, rivets, pop rivets. And I quickly realized how, how interesting and compelling the material was. Um, I was looking at a lot of Lee Bontecue at the time that I made these. I hope people maybe see 
some correlations, but I started airbrushing them using a water-based non-toxic um, solution that uh, wants to bind. It uses polyacrylic to bind to the plastic, so it gives it a really nice, almost glass-like quality and allowed me the freedom to pick colors. I think of it as sort of like playing with, uh, painting with garbage sometimes. <laughs> anyway, so doing that, that jungle installation, really quickly the work started gaining momentum and people, it, it resonated with people because we're not idiots. We can all see that this plastic thing is out of control. Um, so I was right away hired to do a, a large scale commission for it was Merrill Lynch at the time, but now it's Bank of America. And I collected bottles from their recycling bins for maybe two weeks, and it was enough to make the sculpture out of 15,000 bottles. Um, this is what it looked like working with a small crew in Brooklyn back in the day. And um, while, while that was happening, of course, I decided to have a baby and didn't tell them that I was pregnant. <laughs> I didn't want the, the project to be taken away from me, which is, at the time, pretty likely. Um, so these are the tools that I use, the pop rivet, hand, hand rivet tool. That's a wonderful way of fastening things. Very, very quick and dirty and easy. Um, we also have pneumatic versions of this for when we have to do a lot of riveting. Um, this is what the piece looked like prior to being painted. You can see the carriage that, um, and the swing that our daughter Ona was in. <laughs> she literally grew up underneath this sort of situation. Um, we rented this enormous space in, in Brooklyn to make the piece in. And this is what it looked like installed. Um, under skylights, uh, 95 hang points. I think it was the first sculpture made out of this many bottles of that scale and um, 65 feet, roughly, and um, <laughs> they asked me to give the piece a warranty, <laughs> like a five-year warranty, which I thought was really funny because polyethylene terephthalate bottles in, in sunlight will last for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, anyway, so this one is, um, it's still there and it's, it's faded in a way that I really love. I, I need to get new pictures of it, but um, with the light hitting it, the colors are gradually getting softer and more subtle. And there's a bird living in it right now, which is nice. <laughs> I like that, <laughs> trying to create habitats, but anyway. Okay, so here we go. Art, global language, plastic pollution, global problem. I don't know what else to say about that, except it seems really natural to me to play this way, and especially reflecting on these kinds of situations that, you know, the vast majority of that material is not from there. Uh, we create more waste per capita than any other nation in the world. So shortly after that piece, I was invited to make The Great Indoors, which um, was at Rice University, Rice Gallery. It was a wonderful exhibition space dedicated exclusively to installation art. And the piece actually was only about 85% complete. There was a big hurricane in the middle of the installation and um, we ended up sleeping on a cot in the gallery office <laughs> with our baby. <laughs> um, to finish the piece, you couldn't get, you know, you couldn't drive there. There were trees down everywhere. It was, um, it was an interesting adventure. It seems to be a trend. A lot of the time I make work talking about the environment and then the environment shows up. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's the, the, the girls. So the one on the left is Ona. She's just turned 16. And the one on the right is Isla. And she just turned 12. So there's good news sometimes, right? This keeps happening. People are waking up to all sorts of things in the world. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. Um, showing you this as a scale model. Uh, I'm really, you know, sometimes you have these jobs in your life growing up and you don't know what you're gonna do with the skills you acquire. I didn't realize when I was uh, an art director um, and a production designer for Viacom Networks right after college that 
I was going to use the skills I got building 3D scale models for, for making sculpture out of plastic garbage. So this is the piece um, in my studio that I had, and this is the piece installed. And it's called Lift, and this one is about 13 feet in diameter for the big orb, and it rotates very, very slowly using solar power, and it lights up at night. It's at Rice University also, at their um, Health and Recreation Center. And they just did a, they just did a overhaul on the solar because I guess it was 2009 that it was installed. So the solar needed some maintenance, but it's back up and running. So if you read the catalog, there's a beautiful, beautiful essay by Katie Gasto, and she talks about this a little bit and how I think of waste as displaced abundance. Um, and it's just about, it's, it's sort of about uh, like homelessness, you know, this material just needs a home and finding the right home for these pieces is not always easy, but sometimes miraculous things happen and have happened along the path for me. This was one of them. I got to partner with students at seven different schools in Philadelphia who wanted to collect white bottle caps and clear bottle caps to create this piece called Be Like Water, which is actually a Bruce Lee quote. And you can see there's a little bit of this material in, in this exhibition. But um, the reason this happened really was because I figured out that if you take a two liter water, uh, bottle, like a soda bottle, and you spiral cut it in a quarter of an inch thick, it yields 25 feet. And the tensile strength of polyethylene terephthalate is astonishing. It is so strong and it lasts forever. So it made the perfect substrate to thread through with all these caps. And so this piece is like water in a way because it, it can travel and conform to different architectural settings. And this was maybe one of my favorite installations of the piece. So some of them take 80,000 bottle caps. <laughs> Some of them just 5,000 or so bottles. Um, this is just a detail of one of my favorite um, parts of a piece called Updrop. It's thinking about how we can, you know, we can be really sad about things and for good reason sometimes, but anything that's still in motion, there's potential to shift that trajectory. So the, the nature of plastic is it's constantly in motion. You know, it's always morphing and changing and evolving, design for design's sake. A lot of the time with these products, like, there's no reason to have a new design for the current Dasani bottle. You know, it could really be the same forever, but anyway, okay. So a lot of people think of, you know, just marine life. And it turns out this material is getting into everything. So every now and then I create a piece that's a bit darker. Uh, largely to sort of help people recognize that I'm not just trying to Pollyanna, like make it pretty, you know, that's not going to fix it. And I wanted to sort of just put a little emphasis on the dark insidious nature of this. And I was thinking a lot about Carl Jung at the time and the idea of what you resist persisting and how most of this material is just being buried and hidden and it, it just, we think it goes away when there is no way. So this piece, um, Marshall was a little bit mad at me when I made it <laughs> because he thought like this is going to be a black cloud that follows us around for <laughs> the rest of our lives. Um, but fortunately, a very forward-thinking, brilliant collector decided to buy it and hang it over her dining table, which was amazing. So this is a piece we really wanted to include in this exhibition. It's called Jetsam. And it's different. Uh, it marks like a, a change in my work where I started using welding, industrial plastic welding. And you can see those are not bottles anymore. The armature for this piece is made out of welded industrial thick plastic debris. So I think a lot about how it's a growing problem. And then I also think about how other organisms and plants behave and they grow in a direction that's beneficial to them. So this is a piece called Plant Perception. And that's a, we rented a, 
a celery storage space to build the piece in. And then we installed it in a, around a corner office in a Noble Energy. And my thought was probably they'll factor in their plastic footprint, you know. So there are little lights, thank goodness. You know, there are things that are possible that people don't realize are possible because they're not taking place and they're typically cost prohibitive, you know, it's not a, a way to make money. Um, this is, so I grew up in Hawaii, right? This is actually a beach on the Big Island. Um, it's called Camilo Beach and it's on the southernmost tip of the Big Island. And one of the other, mir like these miracles type things keep happening in my practice. And this was another one. Um, it was the middle of the winter, and we were broke. <laughs> we were living in Brooklyn, and we had a baby. She was, she, I guess she was two, maybe, at the time. Two and a half, three years old. And I was invited by the, Ho the Waimea Ocean Film Festival to come to Hawaii for a month to create a piece out of plastic debris that was washing ashore at this beach. And. Uh, this is the piece I created. And I tried to take like a Andy Goldsworthy approach where I didn't use anything except for the material. It was a very different way of working. But it was really interesting because, you know, the Hawaii Wildlife Fund would do these cleanups every two to three months at that beach and they would collect tons, like two to three tons of material every time. And this is because of the proximity to the North Pacific, North Pacific gyre. Turns out there are gyres in every ocean. So plastics, you know, sort of circumambulating around. It's, it's free material. But um, it was interesting because I could see evidence of where the material was coming from. There were Russian motor oil bottles, milk crates from Korea. Like it was, it was very interesting because it helped me really understand how global of an issue it is and how nobody owns it. So that really inspired me to start Project Vortex. Um, partially because it was so heavy and depressing. And I thought, I can't be the only artist who's interested in doing something about this. So I started reaching out and finding other artists who were working with plastic debris and designers and architects who were doing innovative things. And trying to sort of like bring our, our voices together, share resources, support each other, um, like that kind of thing. And these are some of the incredible artists I found. You know, what they do. So I'll get inquiries, you know, if it's a different part of the world, I'll say, well, why don't you just reach out to this local artist who's also working with plastic debris because it would be much better for the planet. And it's also really nice to know I'm not alone. And I'm sure for them as well. So. This was uh, really exciting to be able to help uh, sponsor a piece by an artist and help her um, install this piece. So there's an economic model with Project Vortex that I try to integrate as well. And the way it works, and the way it works with like the piece I created in Hawaii is the sales from the, pro the proceeds, the profit from the sales of these pieces, where I'm, I'm flown to Hawaii for a month and given like a team of high school students to work with me for their entire Christmas break and introduce me to new music and help scrub and clean all the plastic and thread it all together. I mean, that's crazy. That doesn't happen, you know? So when things like that happen and a community is that supportive of my work, um, I try to make pieces for that community that will go back to the conservation efforts in that community. So that, that's part of the model for Project Vortex. So all the artists on the website are doing the same kind of thing. Um, and this was another piece that was um, made with bottles from two river cleanup organizations collected the bottles for me. And this one is called The Quality of Mercy. And it uses fiber optics. It was our first attempt or play with the fiber optics. And uh, 
yeah, it shifts in color temperature from warm to cool, very slowly. So, maybe, I think it was like 2014 or something? I'm really bad with dates. Anyway, some time ago, <laughs> I, was, I had this other miracle happen where I was invited to go design and teach a course at a liberal arts college and I was told I could do whatever I wanted and I got paid to do this. So I went and I worked with these students who had never taken a sculpture class in their entire lives. They didn't have a sculpture studio. Most of them had never used a drill. They didn't have any equipment. Um, <laughs> and there was only one boy, you can see him in the back. And what we did was we went on a river cleanup. And the thing that happens with plastic is it tends to sink. Right? So what you see floating on the surface really represents a small fraction of what's in our waters. So you'll see something that looks like a, like a rock, and then you rub it with your boot and you realize, oh, that's actually an old high chair or an old television set from the 80s. You know? so, so it was surprising because to look at the river, it didn't look too bad, or the creek. And within a couple hours, we got two truckloads of material. And then the assignment is the students have to make a piece of art that integrates at least one piece of the material that they collected from the cleanup. And they have to make it so it can't be confused with garbage. So it's emphasizing hands and craft. And these are some of the things these students made, which um, really blew my mind. Um, and this was the first iteration of it that I worked with directly with the students and the, and the school to do. And what was incredible, you know, the, the idea is then all the artwork that the students make goes to an exhibition space, a cultural venue that's not actually at the school. So it's a public space. And the work is auctioned off. So this kind of raises the caliber of work the students would do because it's not following the typical model where it would be you know, in a crit with their classroom and then probably go into the waste stream. You know? Instead, it comes from the waste stream and then finds its way into this setting where you know, moms and people who are running conservation groups are fighting. They're, they're bartering, like, trying to like, outbid each other to win these pieces. And it's really lovely thing that I love to do. And actually, Keen, Keen State is doing, um, I think they're doing an exhibition here, too, of the students' work. Is that true? Yeah, they will be here. Yeah, so that'll be here soon. I'm excited to see what they've done. Okay, so, um, the, the darkness, you know, it's part of the situation. And we have to be realistic. And these are the types of news that I'm finding out about all the time. And it's tragic, you know? And kids, young people especially get it. You know, I, a lot of the time I think to myself, the reason I'm doing this is for everybody after me, everybody younger than me who's going to inherit this situation. You know, the plastic's not going to go anywhere. So we might as well put it in a way that we can live with it where it will do no harm. So this is a, a project I did with a camp and a bunch of students. So another funny thing happened. Um, let's see, a few years ago, 2019, I think, I was invited to go to the Middle East for the first time. I went to Abu Dhabi for a cultural summit that was honoring Madeleine Albright. And at first I thought, this is not what I should be doing. This is basically Petroland. You know, it's where we're, we're dealing with petroleum byproducts and I'm going to go to fly halfway around the world and the, the, all the fossil fuel, like, you know. But I always look at these opportunities and think, well, if, if there's an, a way to make a change happen in some people's mindsets, then it's worth it. And I had a bucket list wish of riding a camel in the desert since I was a little girl. So I went to do that, and while I was there, I don't know if, if any of you have ever gone 
um, to the desert like that, but they take you out. It's called dune bashing. You go in these SUVs with all the air taken out of the tires so that it's soft, and you go kind of bouncing on the dunes. And they take you out until you can see nothing in any direction. And it's a little bit scary because there's no GPS, like, and the dunes are sh changing shapes all the time. So it's a very odd experience, but I got to finally in the middle of nowhere, nothing as far as you could see in any direction, get on this camel. And while I was riding around on it, I started noticing in the valleys of the dunes, plastic garbage. So it all matters, you know, that's why it's called matter. So I play with, I, I just play with all of it. And these, these are really, really easy and fun to play with. I highly recommend it. Um, this is a little piece called The Monkey and the Mole. <laughs> and, you know, I have, to, I have to be silly and have fun with it. Otherwise, it's just too heavy. Nobody could possibly do it, you know? So you have to kind of stay focused on the light. So these are some little pieces. Ah, sorry. <laughs> So this is the thing I discovered, actually, the first article came out a few years ago and it was about the Pyrenees Mountains, um, microplastics in the air being detected there. So I made this piece called Cloudy with a Chance of Plastic. Mm. <laughs> and um, it's just, you know, welded, thin gauge plastic debris, super fun and easy to do. And I started thinking a lot about where our heads are at and how we kind of just ignore these things. And it's kind of the root of ignorance, you know, <laughs> when you ignore things. So I'm trying to like keep it on people's minds. And that's why I started making these headpieces and fascinators. And I was really agreeable to this idea. It started from a friend of mine needing a, a headpiece to wear to the, um, what is it, this race, the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> and so I kind of just went to town with it and I've been really enjoying making things that you can wear. So this is um, Ona and Isla, a little bit older, and we were invited to go to St. Andrews in New Brunswick in Canada and uh, do a piece with these fish boxes that, you know, I think most people are aware at this point, but they certainly weren't at the time that most plastic certainly was not being recycled on continent. It was being shipped overseas to be not recycled. That's not even a real word. It should be downcycled is the correct term. But um, these were not able to be processed in any way on the continent. And they're made out of low linear density polyethylene, which is a very nice material to work with. It's kind of buttery. All the tools that you use for working with plastic are the same as what you would use for woodworking, except they're less hard on the tools. Um, so Marshall and I and our kids went up and started playing with these. And this is the piece Dino. <coughs> Dino was the result of that. And it's an outdoor piece. It was the first one I made. Um, and it's in Kingsbury Gardens. I'm actually going back there this summer to make another piece. I guess it's held up, so that's, that's good news. Um, and this is another um, excursion to Hawaii that keeps, there's like mystical energy in the world that takes you to places, right? Sometimes I feel like flotsam or jetsam myself in that I get these pulled to different places to do these, these things. So this was back in Hawaii again, working with sustainable coastlines. And it was a very tight deadline, and there were hurricanes again, and we had to move repeatedly <laughs> throughout the month we were there. It was very high drama, but this was the piece made exclusively out of ocean plastic. And I actually left a few barnacles on the top. I think you can see them. So yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of plastic. One of the, people, one of the first questions people typically ask me is, where do you get the material? And I'm always surprised by that question because it's kind of like, where do you not get the material? <laughs> like, it's so everywhere. 
Um, but these are what the troika are made out of. Um, these types of barrels that are used for storing things like soda syrups and oils for cooking or detergents for car washes or cafeterias, like in large, large amounts of things. And if they get a little crack or a little dent, they don't get recycled. So, turns out they're really nice, nice material to work with as well. They're high density polyethylene, which is completely safe to weld. Uh, you can take them to their melting temperature and they don't release any toxins whatsoever. So that's something I'm really trying to interest academic institutions into utilizing. Um, the equipment, the, the tool, the welder, that I will show you, you can see me using it there, is basically like a MIG welder, but for plastic. And it's typically only used for virgin plastics, but I don't do that. <laughs> so, so this this is this material. I started working with the Orange County um, recycling coordinator to collect those when they had a dent or a crack in them because, I mean, they're so excessive. I feel like maybe a third would have gotten the point across of how many <laughs> how many they use there. So, so, but I love this material, and you can see the gypsies behind you um, are made out of that. And what's so wonderful about plastic that you know, I, I was actually a New York State metal, like a certified metal welder before I started welding plastic. So a lot of the same, you know, things apply. Uh, and what I love about it that's very different from metal is that it lets you play with light. So these guys are outside on the, on the, what do you call this? Awning, thank you, <laughs> on the awning here, and it's super fun to see them moving around in different ways. They can just do whatever they want, um, but those are also welded, high-density polyethylene, like the barrels and the trash bins and stuff like that. Um, it's just me playing. One of my favorite moments uh, as an artist was when a dance troupe came and did a whole performance piece underneath this. And the reflections was really lovely. There was a similar thing that happened with this installation. Um, I called it the tide is high. And right before we installed, Charleston was underwater from flooding. So I felt a little weird about that. But yeah. So, um, you know, we, we, we wake up and we just stay at it, you know, and we find different ways to bring things to light. It's, I was talking to Danny earlier about how I think of being an artist as kind of like being gay. You just, you just are. It's not like you decide you're going to be. <laughs> and then you have to figure out how to be okay with it. And you're just like, wow, this is who I am. <laughs> So, um, yeah, this is our daughter Ona wearing Plant Apocalypse, which was titled by our other daughter. Um, I started working with these straps, the strapping that they use for boxes. And uh, turns out you can do all kinds of fun things with those too. So, this, this was, you know, I just keep entertaining every op option there is. You know, I think that's what artists are supposed to do, is just entertain all the options some for longer than others. Um, but this was a, a giant barrel used for water, for agriculture, and it had a little crack in it. So we decided it should instead be sculpted and turned into this. <laughs> so this is very thick gauge. It's about half an inch thick material. Um, and the welder is great because it can weld all different, like 12 different chemical compositions and many, many different gauges of plastic. And this has uh, been up for at least a year now at the Rockland Center for the Arts in Nyack, in their sculpture garden. And it was originally called Learning Curves, but I changed the title to 88% because using pyrolysis, it turns out you can actually extract 88% of the fuel used to make high-density polyethylene. And scientists are doing this, but it's very expensive. So this is what the welder 
looks like in case anybody wants to try playing with plastic welding I highly recommend it very satisfying process and great because you don't have anywhere near as much toxin toxic fumes as metal welding it's not you know you can work with plastic debris in your local area and weld it and it's very easy it's easier than a MIG welder you don't have to wear a helmet in fact my helmet from when I did metal welding is now on the other side of this room with plastic debris welded to it. <laughs> um, okay, so that's what that is. Um, this is a wall relief I created for a lovely lady a couple years ago. Um, and for that one, I used a different kind of welder. This is an ultrasonic welder that is great for... Um, you can see on the, the fascinators, the little head pieces, what the welds look like. They're just like a little spot weld. And they work really well on thin gauge plastics. And I was a little nervous when we first started experimenting with this one because I have animals. And I thought, oh, what if the frequency is disturbing to them but doesn't bother them at all? And there are no fumes whatsoever. And it actually is interesting because most welding techniques, you have to have two of the same type of materials to weld them with any kind of structural integrity. But the ultrasonic welder can weld certain disparate materials together, which is very cool. It also works on CDs. Um, <laughs> so this is what I like to do with my days on this beautiful planet. This is a piece called Nitty Gritty Bang Bang. <laughs> <laughs> and for this one, it's actually, I think it was the first or second one where I started playing around with also sewing into the material with an industrial sewing machine. Um, this is a piece that's right over there. It's called Quinn. And I love the story with this piece. It, it actually happened because a little boy asked his mother to send me the wrapper that goes around Christmas trees when they put them on your roof in New York City because he was really upset about what would happen with that net. So I integrated it into this piece and named it after him. And I've since lost his mother's email address, so she doesn't know, but maybe someday she'll find out. Anyway, okay, so this is, this is good news. You know, this is recent. These things are happening frequently. Um, more and more places are banning single-use disposable plastics, which is fantastic. You'll notice in pink highlight that it says, including quote-unquote biodegradable, compostable, and recycled. Because none of that's really real. <laughs> so, so yay. Um, so this is about that strapping. What, what happens to me that's really interesting is I get my art supplies for free. Right, so all my energy and income go into m m transforming the materials instead of buying the materials. It's not extractive. Um, but people will notice, you know, this is not banned anywhere, this stuff yet. And people will notice it accumulating and give it to me. So I do that. <laughs> And actually, this has become one of my favorite techniques. Um, I, love, I love weaving, and I'm starting to learn about some Japanese weaving techniques uh, for some upcoming projects. But it's an incredibly uh, soothing process. And I also love how connected I feel with traditional, different traditional artists throughout the ages who have been doing this. Um, in addition, it really speaks to this idea of, like my, my latest mantra has been simplify, eliminate, organize, generate. So that's what I'm thinking about when I'm doing things like this, to try to you know, follow the steps in this dance of transformation. And um, the other new process which you've probably noticed in this exhibition are some large scale 3D printed objects that are on a stage here and suspended in that area. Um, this is a really exciting chapter for me in my studio because it turns out you can actually 3D print with completely upcycled plastic debris. So the scale of it 
it takes up most of my studio now, <laughs> but we have one of these. And um, I also have one of those. It looks like an iron. Um, what it is is a state-of-the-art uh, high-resolution 3D scanner. So this all came to being uh, part of my tools because I was commissioned last year by Amazon of all clients, very interesting, to create a piece for their new corporate headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. And the piece was all about mushrooms. So I love mushrooms um, because, well, for many, many reasons. Um, but what really inspired that piece was learning about the Omphalaus eludens, which is a bioluminescing mushroom. And it grows in the area, the woodlands around Arlington. I didn't know that there were bioluminescing mushrooms until I did this research. And then I realized, wow, there's like a hundred known bioluminescing mushrooms. And also knowing that a lot of fungi ingest plastic and then you can eat them and they're healthy to eat. The oyster mushrooms are great at this. But um, so I got really excited about this idea of mushrooms in general. And I started going on all these forays with mycologists and walking through the woods and finding specimens and then scanning them and turning them into sculptures made out of plastic debris. And that's, a, that's just a bolete in the front and behind it is a blackening brittle gill. Um, and there's the jack-o'-lantern. There's so much magic actually in this story. It was a very, very difficult project to pull together, but I was looking for that mushroom on the left, the Omphalatus eludens, all summer. And I was kind of panicking because it was supposed to be the star of this whole installation I was hired to do. And I couldn't find it. And I was getting towards the end. I was running out of time to print it. And we were driving up our driveway after a foray in the woods nearby and Marshall, my husband, looked out the window on our driveway at an oak tree and was like, wait a minute, what's that? <laughs> it was like the holy grail of mushrooms. So, so it was kind of incredible to find a flush of them like that. But what I really love is the heads on those two mushrooms on the left. Do you see how they're growing together? So beautiful. So. Um, so this is us installing the piece. Um, I think that's Roby. He was here helping install this exhibition as well. Um, this is in Arlington. This is what they look like during the day. And at night they glow. There's, I think the tallest one is about six and a half feet tall. That one actually in the middle is called the prototaxites. And if you Google it, it's fascinating. They were actually 25 feet tall mushrooms, prehistoric, that people, have, you know, scientists have found fossils of, fossils of all over New York, which is amazing. But they didn't have the heads, so um, they just came like spires to kind of points, soft points. And I gave them heads and kind of personified them a little, or anthropomorphized them a little, so they could have a romance. These are spring polypores, and um, they all have um, fiber optics that are motion sensored. So when you walk through the park, they, they breathe at the, the rate of like a calm human heart, but when they sense motion, they breathe a little bit brighter. So you can see where the cameras are. Oh, oh, I should mention this too. So about half of them are real specimens and just under half are made up. Because <laughs> so, I'm, I'm trying to play with nature, but not harm nature, so. Um, so this is one of the places I get the filament from. Uh, it's actually the only place in the world yet that is able to make a filament out of completely upcycled plastic debris that works with a large format 3D printer. And uh, these are experiments that are here where I've taken hand manipulated plastic debris and inserted it between the lines of filament as it's being printed. Um, I wanted to create this piece about this um, kind, of, kind of invasive maple tree that has ended up here called the Amur maple. And I don't know why the microphone just got really loud, sorry. Um, but that's basically the shape of their leaves. And these little guys, um, 
are also just small 3D prints where I scanned a succulent in my house and then manipulated it a little bit, played around with it digitally, and then printed them out of plastic debris. And, and then these guys, my newest little friends. <laughs> um, these are alights and they have, um, they're rechargeable and dimmable and they're made out of post-industrial medical grade plastic debris. And I hope that uh, they bring people joy. That's the goal. So this is some good news that just came out recently as well. And people, you know, if you feel like you want to try, you can help making it stylish, you know, to not do it, not play with the plastic unless you're doing it in a way that'll keep it out of the waste stream. Thank you. I hope you guys have questions because I'm here to answer anything you might want to know. <laughs> Does anybody want to ask comments, concerns? Yes. Well, these are obviously very labor intensive. Do you want to use this? Yeah. Oh, you don't have to if you're not comfortable. Oh, that's why. Okay. Um, yes. All of the sniffing and shaping, do you have assistance? Sometimes. Sometimes, not always. Um, it depends. Oh, yeah, here. Sorry. So, did everybody hear the question? Um, the labor intensiveness of it, and do I have assistance? There have been times where I've had like 25 people working with me. Um, and times where I have nobody, just me. So it really, it varies. It depends on the project. I love hiring young artists. I love giving young people opportunities to work in the studio because it's like, it's like a knitting circle. You know, it's, it's super fun. Romances happen, which I love, I love observing. Um, and you know, they be, it's, it's quiet relatively. The work is not like super noisy and, and bad and environment to be in. So you can have conversations while you're working. And a lot of it's very repetitive too. So you, once you get the hang of it, you can just sort of enjoy the process and the company of, of others. And there's something really nice about helping other artists find each other and, and be reminded that it is possible. You know, a lot of people dissuade their young people from getting careers in the arts for many reasons that are understandable, but you know, if I can do it, I think anybody can. So, any other questions? Yes. How do you control strapping material that has a mind of its own? Yeah. That's a good question. It does. But you know, I think it's because I've been working. Did everybody hear that? How do I control the strapping material? I think because I've been working with plastic for so long now, I can really, like, you get like a sensory. Um, like you start to really know what it can do, what it can't do, how to manipulate it, how to control it. And it's actually pretty easy um, to work with um, once you straighten it out. You know, I've created kind of almost like looms in the studio for, weld, uh, for, for weaving with them. They also weld with the ultrasonic welder really nicely. So you can see um, on that piece, I was able to do some loops that you wouldn't be able to do with really any other material because I can lock them in place with the ultrasonic welder. But I get them in giant knotted bags, you know, they just, because nobody's going to organize it and clean it in advance of sending it to me. So, but I, I'm still grateful that they do that because it shows that they care and they're taking action. And any action is better than no action, right? So the first step is to un unravel it all. And I sort it by color. And then I usually use clothespins or something to give it a memory. Plastic has like a memory. So you can convince it to stay in a certain form if you train it. It's trainable. <laughs> so yeah, that's how. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Hi. My name is really more of a comment than a okay. question, but I, what I wanted to say was how deeply I appreciate your generosity of um, sharing with us 
the implements that you use to, to make. And um, I just feel like that kind of attitude is so beautiful and it's not particularly common. I noticed, for example, in the Project Vortex website, you have curricula that you share with other teaching artists. And I just want to thank you for it because, and, and also to say that, you know, we need all, all of us to, yeah. to figure out what the hell to do, you know. Yeah, it's not <laughs> going anywhere. Yeah. And yeah. you are modeling it, that, and I am deeply thankful. Thank you. That means so much to me. Yeah, I'm, I've always felt like the more the merrier. You know, anybody can do, and like doing anything with it is better than doing nothing with it. You know, so. And actually, that's one of the other great things about um, working with students with the material is because a lot of young, like what you have to be to be a good artist, I think, is really sensitive, right? So when you're really sensitive, sometimes you can be really timid and afraid, like blank canvas syndrome is a real thing where you're like, oh, I'm going to mess up this pristine canvas. But with plastic debris, you can't make it worse than it already is. So it's like this super like liberating, you know, it's, it's nice. It's like a, it's got a, a warm, welcoming aspect to it that way. And it really frees people up to just, just play with it, you know. If other people can figure out ways to make it, so insidiously <laughs> problematic in our lives, maybe we can all figure out ways to make it the opposite. So, thank you for your comment. Yes? How's the inventory control for you? Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what was the question? How's inventory control for me? Um, it's, it's, you know... <laughs> yeah, yeah, we definitely... Um, you know, other women my age collect handbags. You know, or shoes. <laughs> As you can see, I have a really big bottle cap collection <laughs> that I've been... Um, yeah, I mean, I have a, a shipping container that I have a lot of things stored in. And you get creative, you know, when you have to. It's amazing how much you can fit in small spaces when you need to. And the second you organize it, it takes up a lot less space, right? And there's something meditative and beautiful about just slowing down and organizing something that's just pure chaos and neglect you know and and that you can find ways to iron it and like bring it into smaller footprints you know and then it becomes appealing to work with because then you have your palette laid out in front of you instead of just a jumbled mess so it was an artist that developed barcodes because they couldn't inventory all of their parts really so they optically develop the barcode in order to be able to record where the parts were. And so it's just it's kind of that dialogue. Yeah. The plastic comes with barcode, right? That's an interesting idea. It actually makes me think of the next tool I'm really hoping I can get. <laughs> it's a spectrometer, which is basically what you would use. To, you can scan any material and it'll tell you the exact chemical composition of it, which would make you know, a lot of this material isn't labeled at all, especially when you get ocean plastic. It's been floating around for who knows how long, and there's no indication of what it's made out of, but that would make it so that I could use it and work with it. So, yeah. Would that fit in your tool belt? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have this tool belt that you can't believe that has, like, you said it you gave you back problems, actually. Oh, for a sometimes, while, right? yeah, it can be a bit heavy. <laughs> I mean, the whole material. You put a picture of that here. Oh, <laughs> there's no pictures with the. No, oh, no. okay. Next time. I'm obsessed. With I'm sorry. That. Well, actually, the funny thing is, I have many, many tool belts in the studio, and that was the first one I used, and it was actually one that I stole from Marshall. Oh. <laughs> it's like my Wooby tool belt. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's been duct taped and riveted together. The tool belt itself is falling apart, but I don't want to let it go. It's like my favorite tool belt fits really well. Um, any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah. Yay, Sarah. I was wondering how long the 3D printing takes when you're printing something like those, you know. The mushrooms? The mushrooms, yeah. How long does that <sighs> What was the longest one, Marshall? It was like 9, 12 days, 13 oh, days? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And the could thing. You, could you repeat the question? Yeah. What, how long do some of these larger prints take to make? Um, so the thing is, you know, this technique, 
nobody else is doing in the world <laughs> yet. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of trial and error, and one of the things that would happen is, you know, after five days, the print would fail, and then you'd have to start all over again. And a lot of that was happening because we were working with upcycled plastic debris, and you'd get these little lumps in the filament, and that would cause the print to fail, which was a nightmare, because I was working <laughs> under like a really intense deadline that the client, <laughs> so funny, Amazon did, they wanted it next day for free. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, but they, um, they gave, I'm so grateful for the project. I, re I really am. That, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm super excited about it. But it was very challenging because it took a year to get the contract signed. And that was my R&D time. So I didn't have time to figure out. Marshall gave up all his work to help me with it. And it was intense. But... Um, Instead of giving us more time, they shortened the deadline, but gave us a second printer. <laughs> Which is kind of like giving a person who's training for a marathon two treadmills. You know? <laughs> we, it worked out, it's fine. We only, we only kept one of the printers, a, a different a production studio housed the other one for us. But yeah, Marshall actually is working on a patent to make it so that the recycled plastic debris filament, the clogs in it don't cause problems. You know, it basically snip, it, it tells the printer it's out of filament instead of causing it to fail. So we're trying to work on that. He is my brilliant husband. Any other questions or concerns? Yes. What do you got? <laughs> I have two questions. Um, the first one is, are you involved with a project at all having to do with gathering plastic material to make islands that can actually be utilized for lots of different ways? And my second one is, how is this affecting the girls? Are they getting involved in your process at all? Those are the, the, first, the first question I'm not involved at all. I'm not sure how I feel about it. Okay. Because as it photodegrades, like in water, makes microplastics. I don't really like that idea. I'd rather keep it up and out of out of harm, out of creating more harm. But there is merit to it. You know, I can understand. I think it's better to get people organized doing anything with it and thinking about it and making stuff or transforming it or anything is better than nothing with it. Um, in terms of the girls, <laughs> I, I last year I was invited to go to Dubai. I don't know what, I'm like I'm like David Hasselhoff in the Middle East. It's so weird. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but um, they asked me to go create a piece in Dubai. It was a very short period of time. I was working with students from Qatar and Oman and like six or seven different international schools in Dubai. And we had a very, like I think five days or something to make a piece together following the sculpture and intercepting the waste stream model. And I was able to bring Ona with as my assistant. And she still has friends in Dubai and like, you know, she Instagram and talks to them all the time on TikTok or whatever. <laughs> and they don't want to do what I do. I'm sure of it. But they're both really, really talented with visual art in particular. Mm -hmm. So presumably they'll do something cross-disciplinary, you know, because I think those are the kinds of jobs that are going to be really m more, you know, only humans can do that, right? So we can take science and art and combine them in ways that computers never could. So I'm, I'm hoping that they do whatever they want to do, but find something they're really passionate about and presumably art will be part of it. We'll see. Yeah. Or would yes. you share with people Ona and I like kind of here in <laughs> Yeah, so those are portraits of the girls when they were small. Um, I was on a residency uh, that I didn't want to do <laughs> because I didn't want to be away from them when they were small, but um, in order to cope with that experience, I made portraits of them <laughs> out of plastic debris, and it was, you know, kind of their personalities. Um, Isla's a Scorpio, and she's very tricky, <laughs> and she has a really intense temper, um, and she lies. 
and she knows <laughs> that you know, and she doesn't care. <laughs> she's, she's really funny. Um, what's that? Yeah, that was exactly their height at the time that I so made those. For everyone who can't see, Alora's referring to two sculptures that are really getting a chance to see in a minute. Um, I'm actually going to spin Ona around. She got spun the wrong way. She should be that way. Um, so Ona's, Ona's very different. Ona's very balanced and calm, and she has the most beautiful, clear perspective. I mean, the second she was born, I revered her. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> you get to be this person's mom. This is going to be uh, amazing. So, yeah. So that's the story of the girls. And they're actually home by themselves for the first time this weekend. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I'll sleep really well tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes. Do I have mixed feelings about using a 3D printer? Yeah. No. No? Why? Well, I'm just curious. The only part I don't like is sitting still in front of a computer. That's really not comfortable for me. Yeah, because you have to do 3D modeling in order to print it out, and I'm becoming better at doing that. Um, You're happy with the results you get from that? Yes. Well, now that I know the parameters and limitations more uh, with the process, um, it's actually really fun now. But I think about uh, sustainability as an artist, not just in terms of the material and the environment, but sustaining yourself, like making space for yourself and your practice as an artist. So in order to sustain this practice, which I expect I'll probably be doing for the rest of my life. I don't. I don't think I have a choice. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what was that? You get the same hands-on feeling that you get if you made a piece actually as opposed to getting printed. No, it's not exactly the same. What What's interesting is that it feel when you're doing 3D modeling in the program that I'm using is Blender. Um, it feels like you're playing with clay, but on a screen. It's really, really interesting. It's fun to do, but what ends up having that tactile aspect is the end result. So you're welcome to touch the alights, the new pieces, because it's all about, like, they want to be fondled. <laughs> They're like really, really nice to touch and caress. They have a really interesting kind of texture. Um, to them, that is, that's when you get the tactile part. But it's the only process that I don't have that hands on as much with. But it's important to have different kinds of processes so that you're not overusing any one particular muscle or part of your body. So I think it's good to have as many approaches to working with the material as possible. Yes? How long did it take to make this sculpture? The Troika, um, let's see, like three months, I think, right? We had a team, like, yeah, yeah. Um, so the barrels were taken from um, the transfer station at Penn State University. I had a, an exhibition there. They're, this is the first time they've been in, installed anywhere inside. They're usually outdoor sculptures. Um, but uh, they asked me to come and work with some of their plastic debris and make something for an outdoor exhibition at the Arboretum there. And uh, yeah, was, I was thinking about quilling, you know, this paper where you cut little thin strips and make spirals and shapes and stuff. And um, the material is only about like an, between an eighth and a quarter of an inch thick. It's not super thick. So I figured if we spiraled them, they would have a lot more strength. And they're really strong. Like, they've been outside since 2017. So, yeah. Aurora, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. And then I want to invite anyone who wants to stick around and privately chat with Aurora. You're yeah, to do that. of course. Um, and, we'll, and also, I'll just remind you that if you are interested in giving a catalog, you want Aurora to sign it today. This is the first catalog that's been done for my work th since 2007. I can't thank the Brattleboro Museum and Katie and Danny enough. It means so much to me. So, thank you. Last question. Anyone? <laughs> oh? Is it, is, so are those like one barrel red fried and then it just goes up? Or are you, are you like cutting and splicing different strips together? 
Um, well, you can, you can actually see the weld lines on them where they were cut, but I tried to cut as long as possible, gradually getting thinner towards the top so that you can you know, make a tighter uh, diameter as you get towards the top. Um, but they're both the same chemical composition from the same location. I really actually think about those as if there's a giant fossil fuel monster underground and they're just the little <laughs> tendrils. Um, and I have also fantasized about making like a playground piece where more of it comes out and kids can slide on it. It's so strong, you know. Because that's what a lot of playground equipment is made out of, is plastic. So people get really confused about it. They think, oh, it's gonna, not going to last outside. I'm like, but you let, you drive around in plastic. <laughs> and you let your kids play on the, uh, okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, no, that was the last one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much.